Um, so everybody, my name is Eileen Alma and I'm the Director of uh, Women's Leadership here at Cody Institute and I'm so pleased to be talking to graduates today located in Cameroon and today um, the session is being co-hosted co by my dear friend and Cody graduate Ada. Ada, do you want to say a, a word about yourself? Hello everyone, I am Adam Ba, thank you very much, Ellie, for the opportunity given to us to come back again. Um, I am the Executive Director of Mother of Hope Cameroon, an organization that works with women and young people. Um, I'm also a Cody graduate 2018, a GCL, that's Global Change Leader. And, and I'm very happy to co-facilitate the session with you. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Ada. And we, you will see Ada and I will go back and forth um, throughout the session. And, you know, we're not a big group of people today on the line. Um, so we don't want to make this too formal. We'd rather just have a really good conversation with each of you. So, um, Kate, if you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, the purpose of our conversation today is, um, is something quite similar to what we've been doing with graduates from other countries. Um, to date, we've had, uh, we've had sessions with um, graduates that are located in Nepal, in Ethiopia, um, in Uganda, and we, uh, now we're having one with all of you. Next week, we're having a conversation with graduates in Nigeria. And we've also had some women's leadership conversations and we're going to continue to do that. So today, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the, um, the state of things in, in Cameroon, um, in particular, um, knowing that, of course, Cameroon is also conflict affected, but right now, um, in particular, we want to focus in a little bit on, on the ways in which we're responding to the pandemic and what kinds of work that you're doing um, in your communities to address the, the issues of the pandemic. So today, the conversation is thinking about um, how the, the coronavirus is hitting Cameroon and it's leaving many, of course, worried about what the, what the new normal is going to be looking like. Um, and, you know, even though the, our governments like, uh, governments around the world, I'm assuming also including in Cameroon, have instituted several measures, there's, there's, there's gaps in the, in, in, in the ways that uh, communities um, are experiencing the coronavirus and in terms of the needs moving forward. So if you go to the next slide, uh, please, Kate. So I'm going to turn now to, uh, to Ada. And, um, you know, just to say why, again, here's a couple points about why we're having the conversation. What we're interested um, in, in, in share in, in doing here is being, is facilitating a conversation amongst you about you know, what needs to be done in terms of community engagement um, and addressing um, responses to the pandemic. Um, discuss a little bit about your experiences and in particular thinking about um, what the gender dynamics might be in terms of the experiences around the pandemic. Um, how men and women are, are, are you know, facing the, the issues either similarly or differently. What might be happening in, in um, based on urban versus rural interventions and so on. So, um, so I'll turn now to Ada. If uh, Kate, you could go to the next slide, please. And Ada, do you want to kick it off with some of your observations about what you're seeing so far in terms of uh, in terms of your uh, community responses to the pandemic? Yes, the the COVID nineteen pandemic actually it's it's a huge challenge for those of us living in Cameroon. We just cannot be able to, to say we are not affected because every sector in the government, in, this, in the private sector, is being affected. Cameroon, uh, as a nation, the prime minister actually put in place certain measures to be able to to protect and to ask its citizens to, 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 to stay safe. And uh, the, the measures that were put in place actually came up on the 16th, on the 6th of March. On the 6th of March, there were several measures that were put in place to be able to regulate the situation because they saw that 
lots of people were getting infected. But with the lockdown, it was not very much very effective because not everyone uh, actually took it um, into, into consideration. Even though schools have been closed down and the children are all at home, so the education system actually respected that so much. In the health system, there's the lots of challenges because there are no, no basically, no, as no much um, medical accessories to be able to carry out uh, effective, effective treatment of COVID. And so they're trying to be able to, to put in place and uh, in place measures that will reduce so many people from getting infected. But again, with what is being put in place and with the basic centers in Yaoundé, where the COVID test is tested and the, the call, the, there is a call center where you can be able to report. Most people don't want to go, don't want to report the cases because when you are, you are, you are, you are being received, you don't longer come back home. And so many people are dying. So you also realize that the, there is the tendency for people not getting the healthcare, the services which they need, and they are mostly in their homes. We also have this refusal syndrome. In some parts of Cameroon, people don't accept that COVID is a reality and they go about doing their, carrying out their activities the way they want. Uh, be before the government had actually restricted uh, movement and asked that everyone stay at home for a period of one month. But again, because of the high rate of poverty, uh, the, the government couldn't manage, um, uh, government could not uh, manage the poverty level and also the demands of the people. The government had to revisit again those decisions and we realized that the, the time limit that was given was extended and uh, people were allowed to now go out, carry out their businesses without less restriction. And that has caused our uh, rate of infection from from um, 2,000, 2,325 to about 5,000 cases today. We have more than 5,000 cases with 165 deaths already. And uh, this is keeping us worried because um, what about the situation of those people who are in, the, say, in the crisis regions? Because we also have a crisis that is, is being um, affected in Cameroon. It means we have a double crisis that is affecting our, our, our country. And uh, now how do we manage the situation when in the, in the big cities we have an influx of internally displaced uh, people, mostly vulnerable women and children who are seeking refuge in these in this, in this cities in very congested and, and, um, and, um, and, and slumpy communities? How do we manage to be able to get them not being infected. That is one of the problems which we, we're looking at. As an organization put in place, like my organization, we actually have been able to carry out sensitization online with other, with other organizations and also other humanitarian actors on the ground. There are lots of sensitization on radio, there are lots of sensitization of uh, fiscal sensitization and the distribution of materials uh, to be able to help the population uh, respect some of the measures put in place. But again, there is difficulty in, in water. We don't have constant flow of water. And so the containers that have been donated in communities and even in, 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 uh, in services do, cannot be able to have water for people to be able to keep the sanitary conditions that they require. And that keeps us really worried. What about the children who are all in the homes, who are those, those children in the streets? How does it, how do we manage to, 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 to keep in place uh, their protection? Because we don't see anything being done to be able to protect the children more in terms of engaging them in, 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 in in activities or in terms of engaging them um, in providing safety measures for them. Most of the children who move out don't have masks and 
the responsibility are solely on the parents. The parents have all the responsibility to take care of their children. And again, the young people are, don't also, are not engaged in the policies that are put in place. The policies that are put in place do not also take into consideration people living with disability. What about their conditions? No one really cares. So there is a lot of lapses in terms of COVID in Cameroon, and we are thinking that raising our voice more is going to be able to help the government put in place. They're wanting children to resume schools next month on the 1st of January, but how would that happen when so much is being, uh, being left undone? We have so many people getting infected and there are no measures put in place to be able to protect these children. And so in, 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 a, in, a, in a global, um, um, in a global feast, you will see that Cameroon still has a lot to be done on the ground to be able to protect its citizens from being infected from COVID-19. So in everything, in all the domains, we don't see gender being mainstreamed. We don't see the gender, uh, the, the, the gender lens in any, everything that they do. We see that there, is, there are lapses. Women cannot be able to have uh, real, the real protection that they deserve. I think I, I'm going to be able to, to stop there and we will get more contributions from our various Cody graduates who are in the house to tell us how they have been able to manage this challenge in the various domains that they work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ada. And I'd like to actually open it up to, to hear where, what others are thinking about the, the challenges that they're seeing right now in their communities. Um, and if you can just, uh, if you could say your, again your name and, um, and whereabouts you're located in Cameroon, that would be helpful. So would, would somebody like to start? Uh, I'm just looking for somebody to put up their hand. Josephine, can you start it? Can you kick it off? And then I'll turn it over to somebody else after that. You got to put your microphone on, please, Josephine. You're muted. Wait, I'll unmute you. And I'll try to. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, you're still muted, Josephine. I think too many of us are trying to. There you go. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, now okay. you can. Go ahead. Sorry about that. I know. Thank you so much. Actually, Ada has given a platform on how COVID is um, affecting Cameroon. I would like to talk specifically on agriculture, um, the sector in which I work for um, food production, basically um, in rural areas in the Southwest. And I would like not just to talk about the Southwest, but to talk about agriculture globally in rural areas in Cameroon and its characteristics and some of the, the, the challenges that we face in agriculture. And what, what are the impacts and what are some of the solutions that we can put on the table? Actually, the agricultural sector in Cameroon is endorsed in the government strategy. And since 2014, um, a special program has been put in place called the Agricultural Investment Development um, Mark and Market Development Project, which the government has put in place to partner with the World Bank in working with cooperatives across the country in the five eco ecological uh, regions of Cameroon on sorghum, cassava, and maize production. My organization, FASADEF, which is for Sustainable Environmental Development, intervenes in implementing the, 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 the local um, activities in the Southwest region with three um, uh, MIS cooperatives. Actually, the issues are real. As Ada said, I don't want to repeat about the conflict um, plagued regions. Um, added to, to conflict is COVID. Now, these people cannot go to the farms. They can't go to the farms because of the measures that Ada has initially mentioned. And because they cannot go to the farms, the women most especially and the children are really suffering. What are they suffering of? 
they cannot put food on their table because the women and the women remain the bread baskets of agriculture in Cameroon. Now that they cannot put bread uh, on their tables, they cannot go out. They are locked indoors and asked to wear masks. They are very poor in by nature so they cannot afford to feed their families most of them have very very large families who are added by the uh, in um, the idps internally di displaced people from the war and therefore this is increasing the level of stress and gender-based violence in in our families in these areas generally Women are actually suffering from this violence, not just from COVID, but from the, from the conflict. So that makes it even more difficult. Economically, they cannot afford because food prices in the market are completely rising. And because they don't have money to afford for food, it is difficult for them to, to raise their families. The nutrition projects that we were carrying out with them, we, we centered on why the corn was for everybody, the cooperatives, men and women, the nutrition projects were geared towards putting women in, women in front to educate them on the importance of nutrition for their families. And then we developed vegetable farms to help them to bring in corn for sale and vegetables to, to, you know, to effectively feed their families. But now that COVID has come, added with conflict, they cannot go to their farms. So their, their daily lives are really, really plagued by, by, by the conflict and, and COVID. And it is even worse by the fact, worsened by the fact that most of them are illiterate and they don't believe in the existence of COVID. So sensitizing them is even more difficult. Now for me as and uh, someone that is implementing these projects on the field, I find it difficult because I cannot go to those areas because of conflict and COVID. And because I cannot go there, I feel for the population that I, with whom I am working. I am doing online sensitization on television. I am also doing um, advocacy work with other women organizations. But my main worry is that these sensitizations, which are meant to open up their, their minds as to the existence of COVID and how they can manage it, is not reaching the grassroots because they are not reachable. You, you, to reach them, you must go there physically. And also, because we cannot go there physically, we are struggling to develop some coping mechanisms. These coping mechanisms, which are getting food to get to them because they don't have food to eat. So how can we raise funds to get food to them? At least non-food items and some food while developing other mechanisms that can be sustainable. So basically, why we'll be coming back to discuss more on it, in rural areas, women are really suffering and the children are most of, of it, the disabled people in this uh, pandemic. So that is what I can just introduce for now while we come back for more discussions. Thank you, Josephine. So you've really um, focused in on um, um, the the challenge, uh, particularly for rural uh, families and especially women in the agricultural sector. I'm just wondering um, if uh, if somebody else would like to speak also to other sectors. And I see that Robbie has uh, a hand up. So Robbie, do you want to go ahead? And then yes, Logan after that. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody from Cameroon. And good, good morning, Eileen. Thank you. Good morning. I am I am Bochi Rabidinka, a 2018 graduate batch of the community-based microfinance for inclusion. Um, um, I am based in Bamenda, and I work with the Cameroon Cooperative Credit Union League, where I work as the training and education officer. Um, indeed, this um, although it is a women lead program. Um, it is something that concerns us so much, and I think I do appreciate the fact that we have this conference. Uh, with the, the outbreak of the pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in the world, and it's, in, it's coming into Cameroon, uh, the Organization where I work, the Cameroon Coast of China, the migrant house. 
Are we together? Hello, someone get yes. to me. Thank you, Robbie. I, yes. I can hear you. At first, there was a bit of delay, but it might have been on my side. Okay, thank you, Eileen. Okay, so I was saying that the pandemic has just come to add to, like, without overemphasizing, to the Northwest and Southwest regions crisis as far as our activities are concerned. And uh, the effect has been so much because it is coming to meet the people that had already been fragilized. Yes, uh, in the Cameroon Cooperative Credit Union League, we cover the entire national territory, where the crisis in the northern part, the Boko Haram, the one down the northwest and southwest, all affects us. So the effect of the pandemic, uh, to us, I think I would like to look at it when we'll be talking later, uh, has been threefold, eh? basically. The economic okay, so you, you've just broke up being, a little bit. Robbie, could you repeat it? You yep. said threefold. The pandemic. Threefold. threefold is, yes, go ahead. Yeah, three, threefold challenge. Mm -hmm. The economic, the social, and the digital. Those and are can the you threefold. elaborate on the digital one? On the digital, because when we come, the very most effective and important measure of managing the COVID pandemic is social distancing. Workplace had to be reorganized such that the staffing is reduced. And now because it is reduced, the movement, for instance, I had to do the trainings that I have to carry the capacity building, the sensitizations on the field, we have to go online. And mm -hmm. not all of the credit unions in the network, because most are found, 60% of our credit unions are found in the rural areas, they were not computerized. It becomes therefore very difficult to be able to give them, offer them the services that we as a network have to for, offer to them. And mm -hmm. even so, because they are not computerized, all of them are not computerized, you then understand that even the workers there, they are know-how on manipulating gadgets. ICT gadgets is very limiting. So it, it, it's a huge challenge, Ali. So, and that is what I'm talking about. I don't know if this makes sense as we'll be talking later on, but that it's is a huge it challenge we're talking about with this Yes. It does make a lot of sense, Robbie. And I just have yeah. a quick follow-up question to you on, on whether you've seen anything um, in response that you have that you feel is innovative in the way that the communities, or sorry, that the credit unions have responded. Has there been anything yes. that, I mean, because it's easy to focus on the challenges, but what yeah. has been the response to that that you've seen? Effectively, effectively. Um, the, the, the credit union network is supervised by the Ministry of Finances in Cameroon, but right. in the SEMAC zone, in the Central African state, it is supervised by the Monetary Authority, calling for back the, commission, the Banking Commission for Central African states. So the government of Cameroon, like Ada said, already brought in measures in March. And those measures, our own titular ministry passed them down to us. And again, the supervisory authorities in the Central African region called back sent some more guidelines on measures to be taken. So we have a whole document on measures um, mm -hmm. that includes what I was just saying, the reorganization of the workplace, respecting social distance, hygienic conditions, and the, in each of the over 200 um, credit unions affiliated to the network, there is a committee in charge of following up that. So every credit union had to, we submitted this plan's latest, latest of, because the COVID, the outbreak in Cameroon, we've had, had the first case, I think it was on the 6th or 7th of March. And uh, immediately before the end of March, we already had all of these plans in the network. And there is a committee that is following up to ensure that at least the basic, there is a committee that does that in the local credit union and the branch offices of the particular credit union. And then there are hygienic measures, portable water to wash hands and soap, uh, the alcoholic based uh, hand sanitizers, and then the, the, the reorganization has also taken into consideration many people have been sent on leave. Mm -hmm. And some actually because uh, of the crisis that were already there, uh, the, the returns, that's, uh, the productivity of the credit unions has fallen down. So some have even gone on technical leave, which leads to the social component. Right. And yeah. who, says social, yeah, who says social component says the woman? Because yeah. being microfinance, we did deal with the people at the base. I think uh, the critical examples, the specific examples will be coming later on as we talk. Sure. Thank okay. you very much, Thank Robbie. Um, and okay. Rogan, um, I'm going to turn over to you and then to you after that, Elsie. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, I want to be very grateful with the last speaker. She actually outlined um, a couple of things which I wanted to come up with. But I will just add on this perspective because um, we, uh, as an organization, a community-based organization, because um, I want to draw the experience for the Community Synergy for Sustainable Development, which um, I'm a co-founder for that, for that um, um, organization. So actually, it's also one of the community-based organizations that is implementing the Global Fund program in Cameroon. And a lot of things um, stood up during this period of COVID-19. And one interesting part is that um, it is very important to, to note that um, our funder as well has been very, very um, 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 helpful to act, to understand the the present situation and also to readapt um, our funding mechanism to able to accommodate the realities on the field today. So normally the program focuses mainly on HIV prevention, which um, as a community perspective, they based on more on the awareness region sensitization and doing the referral to the hospitals where we have the clinical services, which is being handled by the Ministry of Public Health um, selected health facilities. So during this period from March right up to date, there's different things that have been happening along the line. So um, right now, what we are doing is um, uh, we're carrying out a combined action it's not long, longer just HIV and AIDS program. Everyone, we have incorporated as COVID-19 as well. And now, um, one of the issue from the community-based level approach which we face is first is the issue of insecurity. Um, I will just cite one recent example that happened recently in Moyoka. I don't know if we have some graduate from that community, Moyoka, over the weekend. Um, we had cases where the unidentified government actually kidnapped three of our field workers, and which they were actually doing um, community-based um, sensitization of um, COVID issues. And considering the current situation where the government have put in place certain um, um, emergency acts, like people shouldn't go out in public places without the mask, but then the, it's difficult to know that people have to have masks each time they go out and they can't even afford food to eat, talk less of um, um, having that mask all the time. So what we're doing so far, we have had the funding to distribute masks, um, to distribute the masks and also um, other um, 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 alcohol and hand sanitizers and savon and, and um, 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 and the savant soap to the community. And also it's not just to, to distribute, but also how, how do they use these things? How do they understand the, the concept of physical distancing in terms of preventing um, the community spread of COVID-19? So in doing this, we launched a campaign. I don't know, maybe, um, let me just see if I can have, I have some of this action picture on my phone. If you can, can see from my phone from a distance, I don't know. Some of these committees of um, action that um, the, um, they're carrying out. And you see meeting out the community directly, giving out this education, giving out this um, 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 COVID um, um, preventive MM equipment. That is what they have been doing this period of time. So now the issue is, there are a lot of complaints. You start when you started the introduction. You said something about gender's perspective, which is very, very important at this period of insecurity and the pandemic. We notice a lot of gender-based violence issues, and and which, as a result of um, the COVID, people are taking certain advantage of um, the situation to perpetrate certain acts. And also in terms of healthcare, we understand that um, there are other issues of, uh, of, um, of healthcare, which uh, have in some percentage has been abandoned 
women actually had difficulty to access healthcare, health facilities at this point in time. And also the fear which they have um, um, put in terms of the, into the community, like if somebody is sick and you just like you, people actually have that feeling, they have the loved ones, someone just passed away and they just attribute that to COVID and the family, we have a lot of complaints. They said, oh, my, my father was sick and my father wasn't like co anything doing to COVID immediately passed away. The government just said, oh, they need to do the barrier for them because it's COVID case and stuff like that. So we try to see how they can create a balance, even though we're trying to make sure they had that prevention. But how do we understand these are human? We are all humans. These are people, they live with these people. And if we're trying to prevent the community spread of the COVID, but then they should also um, 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 have that um, impact in terms of uh, that feelings, we are, that feelings they have for, for the young, for, for, that, for that loved one in the family. So um, we actually met with um, um, different authorities at the community level. We had this conversation with the, the mayor. And right now, what did, one, one of the major challenges that we are facing right now as we speak is the issue that um, the senior divisional officer for for FACO and for MEME, where the operation is currently going on, which we supervise, um, said that they have stopped, uh, they, want, they, they stopped community action in terms of um, um, distributing COVID and preventive um, 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 products and equipment, labeling that to political campaign or something and saying that maybe it's opposition parties that are sending um, community-based organization to distribute materials. And we had to go a lot, of, a lot of administrative procedure, a lot of documentation to prove to the authority and the governor have to visa that with all the program and project document to show that um, this program where we're currently going on are going to prevent the COVID is not attached to any political party. Because um, I don't know, for some reason, maybe the opposition party had some, some campaign to generate some funds to prevent the community. And based on that political uh, rivals between the ruling party and the opposition, it's affecting the community-based perspective in terms of reaching out to the people. So it's something which has uh, been politicized. And, and when all of that has happened, all the people that suffer is the commoners, the common people in the community, is the rural people because they don't they don't have that facility right now. As the last speaker just spoke, everything economical is down. People don't have difficulty to have food like daily food. People are finding a lot of difficulty, and the the restrictions are like the the law enforcement officers are supervising this particular um, um, act of having the the mass at, in public place. Right. They are actually making this at their own personal profit because they don't yeah. even respect human beings anymore. Any little things that they, they brutalize the community, they brutalize their own people just to make sure they have that 2,000 francs from this from the, the people. They don't even educate them, they don't tell them, they don't even give them. There is no like alternative if this is the challenge, how do we address this? But they're just there to instead take away from the people at this difficult time. So, mm -hmm. so far, maybe I've come again with another um, um, yeah. level thank, of intervention. Thank, thank but you for very now, much. that is what we've been doing. Thank you, Rogan. You, there's a lot packed into your, your comments there. I, I'll just start off by saying what I hear there is, at the beginning is that you as your organization has had to make a, a, a complete shift from the work that you've been doing around HIV to addressing the pandemic given the crisis. But this also speaks to you know, a healthcare sector that was already overburdened. And, you know, how are we, how can we manage um, in, in light of, you know, the, the pandemic that we're in, how can we manage all the other health issues that also uh, are, are critical for uh, the country, including those that affect women, um, uh, such as maternal and child health, you know, child health care, um, um, but also, as you say, the bigger questions around other kinds of illness like HIV and so on. And then what I also heard is unfortunately the challenge when you have the intersection of conflict with the pandemic. And you know, of mm -hmm. course, the, 
the, the people that are losing in this are always those that are the poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. Because not only are they not able to make an income, but they're facing conflict even when they try to leave their homes. There's, there's dynamics all around them that, you know, uh, that makes it very difficult for them to even uh, figure out ways of supporting their family. Um, so the risks for, for, fam for households, whether urban and rural, are, are, are augmented. And we've seen in some cases in other countries where, you know, where conflict has been happening that there has been actually, um, uh, they've, they've halted the conflict because the pandemic has become such a big issue. We've also heard, though, at times, and it depends on the country, yeah. how the pandemic itself has been very politicized. Um, you know, in Canada, actually, what we've seen as a response, and luckily we're a very peaceful country more overall, uh, we've seen actually political parties, um, it, certainly at the outset, set aside the politics and really work together. That doesn't happen across the board. It sounds like it's not necessarily uh, the case in, uh, in, you know, countries, uh, in some of the countries that we're, um, that we've been uh, examining. So I'm going to turn now to Elsie and uh, ask her for her, her thoughts. And then who, I, I'm going to take a look and see who's also got their hand up. Aha, uh -huh, I see Constance and I'm sure there's others and I'm just not seeing them fast enough. We'll come back to you. So Elsie, go ahead. Hi. Uh, please, uh, Helen. Before, before you, before. Oh, okay. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yes. Go ahead, Ada. Go ahead. Hello. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to add. I just wanted to add to the point which you talked about. The conflict, uh, the, the the pandemic, being politicized. Yes, in the areas where the conflict, uh, where we have the conflict, some issues of that have been been able to be recorded. When material which was donated for COVID to to the local population that was suffering were burnt, and we also are also witnessing the fact that many people don't even want to accept that government is doing any actions to help them fight the pandemic. They don't see anything good in what government is doing. Mm. And this makes it very difficult to be able to implement the measures that are put in on the ground. I just wanted to add to that, that we are also facing that kind of challenge. And it's a bit difficult to be able to change the mentality of the people to understand that there must be some support from government, which is meant to, um, to, 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 to solve the problem, not because of any political reasons that government is being able to donate those things. Uh, I think I just wanted to, to re-echo that, that we know that uh, we, we are talking globally. If we, if we really want to be able to talk, let us give the global issues. If we have to get into talking on issues only on the conflict, it wouldn't be very, very balanced. Let us give issues that affect all, all uh, in, that affects Cameroon in a globe because there are also other people who are not in the conflict areas and they want to see how much Cameroon is being uh, treated on this piece. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ada, for that point. Um, I'll turn back to Elsie now, but very good points around the importance of interventions for everyone right now um, by government and otherwise um, by community-based organizations as well. So Elsie, go, go ahead. Hi everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I really appreciate this program and it's really an opportunity for us to speak and give our views of what has been happening on the ground. My name is Elsie Tabemonso. I'm the executive director of Integrated Youth Empowerment Center based in Limbe. Actually, we work to advance gender equality and empower women, youths, and vulnerable children to effect positive change. So our main areas of intervention are healthcare promotion, 
humanitarian response, social justice and peace, and gender-based violence. Looking at our organization and organizations around our area at this time of the pandemic, it's been really challenging. It's a, it has not been easy on our side because as an organization, we have so many challenges we are facing in order to operate and carry out our projects. At the level of the organization, we have tried like to start practicing what is on the ground, social distancing. What we did first was to like rearrange the sitting of the organization to see that it meets the standards of social distancing. We have also work, we have also tried to make sure all employees come to work with face mask and like at the entrance of the office, we have put a stand there where you have to wash your hands before getting into the office. So those are some of the measures we have put in place. Then we have made sure that going out to work because we do most of our work at the field level, going out to work, all, them, all the staffs, they have to put on their face masks and they have to respect social distances two meters apart when they are like talking to clients at the level of the field. So going back to our work, it has not really been easy. We have had so many challenges at this time, drawbacks on our projects. First of all, there is an issue of internet because normally we have an internet we pay generalized in the office where people can access internet and we pay like monthly bills. For some time, everywhere was, the, everywhere was closed and we had to continue paying the bills though we were not using the internet services. And with that, you have to like give the staffs separate, you have to get into separate budgets for the staff for internet services because when, while they were working at home, they still needed to use internet, which was really challenging to us and out of the scope of our budget. Then we also have issues like at this period, we usually have volunteers coming from abroad and other areas to as if they have been a great help in the organization. But at this period, it's not possible because of the COVID-19. So we have gone into measures of creating online volunteering as a way of achieving that. And we have also suspended, suspended some of our projects. We have upcoming projects that were supposed to be coming up, but they have been suspended because of the crisis. And we go now into more of storytelling. We are just like trying to bring out different ways of working while the crisis is going on. Yeah, we, we do more of storytelling now and online advocacy and online stores. Then going back to our work, we have been working on humanitarian response. On our humanitarian response project, we have reviewed our humanitarian response project and added activities for COVID response, where we'll be working in FACO, Indian, and Manu at the grassroots levels. During this project, we'll, work, we'll be doing monitoring and reporting of COVID-19 cases and incidents. We'll establish a flash alert system in the grassroots where they can report cases of COVID-19 and the symptoms at the level of their communities. We also do an assessment on the COVID situation where we can easily get hand-on-hand -hand information from the grassroots levels because that is a really big challenge. Then also on GBV, we have we are also trying, to, we are doing more sensitization on gender-based violence and specifically on COVID-19, try to sensitize the community, especially women on how they can, the different measures they are supposed to put in place and how they can help themselves to get, to not to get into the, the situation, especially domestic violence situations gender-based violence situations, sexual exploitation, because there had been a rise in 
sexual exploitation at this time of the crisis. We have also, we have also written a project where we are expecting budgets to purchase hand sanitizers, face masks, while carrying out the community advocacy, we can like give it to the community, donate it to the community where they can be using it because those things are really important at this time. And with the economic situation, most people cannot afford for it. Yeah. While doing this work also, we make, we put in, since we have a gender policy in place, we make sure we respect the gender policy to make sure that the women and the men are treated equally. Women have what they are supposed to have and everything is done respecting the gender norms. So Elsie, can I interrupt you just there for a second? Yeah. I, um, I just wanna ask you about, I wanna go back just to, to something you said earlier about um, the fact that because of the COVID-19 right now, you haven't been able to utilize volunteers the same way, but you've moved into an online volunteering process. What does that look like? What, what do these online volunteers, what are they doing? Yeah, like for example, we used to have volunteers who come to the organization, like women empowerment volunteers, they work on women's empowerment, we'll have like healthcare volunteers who like go to the ground to work on health issues. But now it has, we have a different phase of the volunteering. Now we look more on like putting up volunteer opportunities for those, for example, web development and how to expand the organization. And we also work with like on healthcare, we want a volunteer who can like come out with different programs, especially COVID-19 programs at this time to be, set, to be used on the ground. If we can have a volunteer who can do that, that will be fine for us. We have just put, we have put up the volunteer opportunities right. and we are waiting for a response. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm just going to, uh, what, I, what I want is just say um, in response to what I heard from, from Elsie, but also from others, is um, that we're really interested in understanding um, responses and addressing gender-based violence in particular in, in the pandemic. So if you have examples of what you've, what you've been doing with your organizations um, and what has been effective, um, please do share them with me um, at womenlead at uh, stfx.ca. Um, I'm, I'm finding that in particular something uh, that I really want to understand globally how um how best we we can move forward on that i think there's there's uh there's a lot of I've, I've heard a lot of good examples of of thinking about sensitization in communities but what i'm curious to know is the effectiveness of the sensitization um and you know and how do we know that it's working or not working so these are things that i think uh, would be great to explore even uh beyond the webinar um, Elsie, I'm going to ask um, if I can come back to you later on because I also see that I've got Constance and then Clotilda um, who, who both have, the, have been putting their hands up. So I'll come back to you, Elsie. Is that okay? Yeah, um, it's okay. Great. Thank you. And so Constance, do you want to go ahead, please? You're it, yeah, there you are. You're a little in the dark, but we can, I think we can see you. And if you, if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, Constance, we cannot hear you. Hello. There you go. Now we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay. I, I will say I'm introducing myself. I'm Constance Kamgar, a uh, Cody graduate 2018, double certificate holder. Um, I, I am the a resident in Yawunde. I, I, I work with uh, 300 Women Voices. I am the co-founder and general coordinator of this uh, association. Okay, uh, since from our 
I was coming back from Cody and my the knowledge skilled to me from Cody. We have I've been working. When we came back from Cody, I tried to to revive my organization, uh, which was not a very very a, a working which was not really smart before I left. And thanks to Cody, when I came back, I had to revive things. And I want to say we have been moving on. We have been moving and working on the ground very effectively. Okay, relation relating to to our organization, we work with. Uh, in, uh, with, in women empowerment and uh, gender on gender-based violence and uh, gender equality. But we focus more on uh, girls' education, women entrepreneurship, and, and peace building. So that is our area of focus where we work. And I want to say we have actually been on the field. So what, what we have been doing so far for now mostly is sensitization. We sensitize, sensitize to, we go to schools, public schools, private schools to sensitize young girls and to meet in houses, to meet with, uh, the mothers and women, to sensitize them on parenting, girl child education especially, on, on, on how to, to, to carry on uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, actions that can lead them to sustainability. Okay, coming to the COVID-19, issue uh, and you know, I want to say uh, we uh, uh, relating to what Ada and Josephine and the others have been saying uh, and the fact that we are based in Yaoundé it's not been a little, it's not been easy for us because of the political policies that have been put in place by the government and uh, the fact that government takes a decision and at a certain time it 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 it, uh, it suspends the decision. It's making it a little bit difficult for for us to actually work on the field, and it's giving the population an idea that COVID nineteen doesn't exist, and it, it is really it is really a, a serious problem on the ground. Now, for us, what have we, what we have been mm -hmm. doing? We try to synthesize the public on relating to the rules and regulation of the WHO on how to prevent. COVID-19, like you have been saying, washing of hands, social distancing, wearing of face masks, and avoid crowded places and things like that. But what we, we have actually done is that when we, 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 have, we, we, have, we have been able to produce face masks, face masks and coming from uh, our, own, for one, our own volunteers, I mean to say the funding coming from our own volunteers and the members, because we haven't had any funding from anywhere. So we're just doing it because we know it is essential. Because when we move along the streets and along the markets, we see a lot of women, because we concentrate more on women, we see they don't put on masks. And we know the life, the, the health of the family lies in the hands of the women. So we, we, we went to the marketplaces, we distributed, we actually had made, we produced uh, 1,000 masks, face masks that we produced using our, some internally displaced women here in Yaoundé. That's what we did. We used the internally displaced women here in Yaoundé where we bought the materials and we give them and we pay them and they produce some very good masks. I just want to, I also want to use the opportunity to thank um, Erin Thomason because I, 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 I gained the skills that she used in producing her own masks. When I saw it on Facebook, I had to take that. Yeah, that's the kind of masks we produce very nice because it covers from the nose right over to the chin and almost half of the face. So I want to also thank her for that because I had to relate to her in, to that. So with the 1,000 face masks that we produced, we, 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 we distributed 500 here in Yaoundé at the Yaoundé 6, uh, Yaoundé 6 area. The Yaoundé 6 area is an area that is made up of uh, a lot of uh, uh, English-speaking Cameroonians, that is people in, and, the, and the many, many the internally displaced persons. So we know when you go to the market, there are some foodstuffs that these people sell that we know if you sell this kind of foodstuff, you are surely coming from the English-speaking zone. So when we discovered those women could not put on face or face masks, that is where we, 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 we capitalized our distribution. So we went to the market, distributed the 500 face masks to these women, Meanwhile, doing that and sensitizing them on how to put on the face masks because there is a problem 
right now in Cameroon, people don't want to put on the face mask and they don't know how to put on the face mask. Because some we always put under the chin, you always see people on the street with the mask under the chin. And some putting it half, you know, or putting one side and things like that. So we, we, we synthesize on how to put on the face mask. 300 of these masks were sent to Mundemba. Mundemba is a locality in the Southwest region. And two, 200 were sent to Isangele. Isangele is a border a village or a town uh, to Nigeria. And we, we did it in relation, we were collaborating with uh, a sister organization, Bakasi Women Forum. So we, 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 we offered them the mask and they had to do the distribution over there. So that is what we, uh, 300 women voices, have been doing on the field. Apart from the masks, we, we, we synthesize them and we give them, a, we, we print little, little papers on how, on the, on the different ways that we can prevent COVID-19. Okay, mm. apart from that, <clears throat> we, the, the members of the, the, the out of the association organization, we had we have been having meetings and we 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 we, we synthesize ourselves on how we have to uh, synthesize other people when we go back to the quarters, how to, how they should go about this prevention and what they have to do. For example, when if you have your neighborhood somebody coming from abroad, like uh, uh, somebody that has just flown in the, in the in the plane from from whatever country the person is coming, we should take a, a, a specific uh, attention on that person to make sure the, uh, uh, if we, and if we have any, if the person have any symptoms of COVID-19, we should call the toll, the toll number of Cameroon, which we have as 15 time, to make sure the Minister of Health is aware as far as that person health is concerned. So that is what we have been doing on the field so far, Elaine. And I want to say on, I want to react on what Greg Rogan said. Uh, the way the, the government is trying to, you know, police, uh, police, police, politized people to put on the first marks and the way the, 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 the campaign the government has been doing. Yes, the government has been doing a lot of campaign in relation to preventing COVID-19. But the issue is, for example, when the government gives uh, uh, assistance to communities, how do this? How do they? How do they uh, uh, distribute these items to the community to make sure it reaches the grassroots? That is the problem, because, for example, our association we, we wrote to the senior divisional officer of uh, of Yaounde Six that we want to volunteer in this distribution because we knew sometimes it's very difficult for those items to reach the, the grassroots population, and we were not responded. We didn't. We were not given a response on that. And, and if you watch the way this distribution is done, we have actually realized those things do not reach the grassroots. Those things do not reach the grassroots. And even if it reaches the grassroots, it is, it is not given entirely because you cannot be giving somebody, uh, um, a, 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 you cannot be giving a village chief three, three, loaves, of, three uh, uh, loaves of soap to distribute to the whole village or to, to tell the village that they should come and wash their hands and you give them one bucket you know, things like that. So it makes it a little bit uh, uh, difficult for the- Yeah, for the and, and you know, I think this is a question again about access uh, to services and access to goods um, that we, you know, we, we've seen, um, you know, in the best of times and how do we, how do we ensure transparency um, and inclusion of, of all people? The, the, the question, and I think this is something that we've been seeing um, you know, in many different cases, in, including here in Canada, is um, is the the lack of resources, the lack of available um, products, whether it's hand sanitizers or masks, and and then who gets what, and where where are the priorities? Um, and so, in the first case, the the actual hospitals, um, the nurses, the doctors have been the primary. Um, the primary recipients of, of, you know, masks and so on, but, but quickly countries are going to, you know, to try to make sure that there's enough of a supply for everyone. So how do you make sure that ha that happens? And Constance, what I heard from you in terms of your organization is the, the, um, the way in which um, 
you know, you've been contributing, you, your organization's been contributing to, to the production. And I think this is something that, um, that I, I, I really think is uh, exciting about um, what I've seen from women's movements globally is the, the, the resourcefulness and the innovation that they've, they've had in terms of uh, the production of masks, of productions of hand sanitizers. So moving very, uh, in, in, very adeptly from sort of one kind of uh, economic uh, product to another um, in, you know, in terms of trying to, you know, meet the times and doing this also for, for some economic gain, but, you know, very little, but still something in terms of being able to produce, uh, to, uh, to have a livelihood. Um, I'm going to now turn to Clotilda, who's been patiently waiting. Um, and I haven't heard yet from patients or a few others, but I'll turn now. Oh, I see hands are going up as I'm talking. I'm going to try to get to everybody, but Clotilda, I'm going to start with you. Uh, could you go ahead, please? Clotilda, do you have your mic on? I don't hear you yet. What is it? There you Hello? go. Nice to hear you. Nice to see you. Thank you, Eileen. I'm happy to see you too after a very long time. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I am Clotilda Andiensa. I'm from Cameroon, specifically from the Northwest region, Bamenda. I am a Global Change Leader graduate, 2015, and I am the coordinator and the founder of the Center for Advocacy in Gender Equality and Action for Development, CAGED. And we work basically in four different areas of um, <coughs> women's empowerment and peace building, under which we tackle issues of gender-based violence, sexual reproductive health, economic empowerment of women. And until the outbreak of crisis, we have been working basically in schools and rural communities. So with the coming of the crisis and the total displacement and destruction of women's homes in their areas and the total, total shutdown of schools, we had to re-strategize and start working mostly with IDP, IDPs, mostly women and girls. And through this, we were able to actually identify um, more than 500 IDPs in Bamenda town. And we provided to them uh, both food and non-food items. We continue to give them our education on sexual reproductive health, creating awareness for them because finding themselves in new communities was increasing their chances of being violated. So we held a number of uh, trainings to make sure we, we, we guide against that. Then we continued making referrals to those who found themselves in these situations. We got into partnership with the CBC Health Board and uh, with the w, uh, uh, WPF program that has established a one-stop shop in Bamenda where those who are violated can go there for um, an inclusive uh, consultation. So uh, with the coming of COVID-19, uh, which also, again, saw the shutdown of schools that were almost starting and we were going to go back to our work. We continued mostly with the, uh, our actions on peace building. And um, we were very fortunate to, to get the funding from the International Civil Society Action Network. Um, I must say here that the coming of COVID-19 actually has disturbed us in that. We had a, a, a very big peace building program which we had to involve women from uh, more than five councils in the Northwest region to mobilize them on the WPS agenda. But now we, that, that is one of the greatest effects that COVID-19 has had on us. So because that project has had to be on hold, which means that our peace um, advocacy program is on hold, but it's important as everyone has to address the COVID-19 before we move on. And so looking at what we have been doing as far as COVID-19 is concerned, um, we are mostly into education and awareness creation. And we are doing our education and awareness creation in two different levels. The first part is online. And doing online advocacy, we actually sat down and came up with a very comprehensive plan. We are actually uh -huh. using just Facebook and the Twitter. And what we did is that we shot videos, live videos in the community, where we realized that there was the denial syndrome. People do not believe in the existence of COVID-19. They call it witchcraft, they call it a political scam, they call it a government game. And uh, as the numbers keep on, uh, kept on increasing, we saw the need to do a kind of um, community-based awareness creation 
using videos shot in their local communities with people they know, using their common language, the pidgin English, so that they can be able to actually understand what this means. So we shot a total of 12 videos, which we have been using. We have been uh, uh, putting up two every week on Facebook. If you follow our Facebook page, it's Kajet, Art for Kajet. If you follow our Facebook page, you see that we put up a video every week. And when we put up this video, it engages so many people. And when people are engaged, they start asking so many questions. And that is how we continue extending our advocacy. And we want to talk about these videos. I've said we have one which is saying, no be witchcraft. No be witchcraft simply means in English that it is not witchcraft. And then the, the action, I think I've been sharing with the Koji network, the actions that are portrayed there are exactly the actions that make people not to adhere to the, the, the principles of COVID-19. And one other thing we have done, I don't want to name all the various videos, but uh, I need to ask something about uh, gender-based violence. One of our videos, which we are still to shoot, we want to shoot it next week because it has to be accompanied by, uh, we have shot it, we want to play it next week. It has to be accompanied by a watch party on gender-based violence where we'll be bringing other experts to connect them online, to share their life experiences. That one is titled Double Wahala. Double Wahala, in Double Wahala, a woman is sharing her experiences with another woman. How the COVID-19 has caused the husband to stay at home all the time. And he's unable to provide the, uh, the basic, the little food that they were having because he's unable to do the little kind of job that he was doing. And so this woman is alone. She faints and brings food and the husband is not satisfied. And above that, he wants to have sex with her like three, four times a day and uh, it ends up with a man beating her and even threatening her with the cuddlers. We have had a lot of discussion around this and we have had men to actually testify to say that COVID-19 is also making them look very weak in front of women because if they have their opportunities to be going about their things, they will not stay at home to see all of what is um, actually happening. Now, when we are, uh, that's at the level of uh, sensitization on social media and Twitter. We have a partnership with five local radio stations, and we have actually uh, recorded five pigeon spots where we are uh, running every day, at least five times per radio uh, station, where they are actually giving the information on how to stay safe from COVID-19 in pigeon English and in some two local languages, which we assume that 80% of the population in the Northwest will be able to, to understand. That is what we, we are doing at the level of the radio station. And we are going to also have a one day live uh, show or live, uh, yeah, live show on each radio station where we bring a medical personnel, a gender-based violence specialist and a social worker to talk. The social worker will be talking on the psychosocial support that people need during this period and the gender-based violence will be highlighting issues of gender-based violence while the medical personnel will reiterate how people need to stay safe from COVID-19. Another aspect of uh, gender-based violence that we have been tackling is that adolescent girls and young women suffer a lot. As you know, in the next two days, we'll be celebrating World Menstruation Day. And one of the issues that they suffer is the access to menstrual uh, health products. And during this period, since most people do little businesses to be able to have all these uh, products, they are actually unable. So it is part of the package that we are taking down to the field. So for every community that where we are identifying, because our project, let me come back, our project actually is, address, is tackling IDP women and women living with disabilities. We, we are reaching out to 200 IDP women and women living with disabilities. And um, that is the third part of our project, which has to do with uh, giving out tutorials. So we have already trained 20 community uh, women leaders who are right now in their community identifying the IDPs and other women living with disabilities who are benefiting from our gadgets. So we set up at the beginning of the project, we set up a production center we got three sewing machines. We got three IDP women who have sewing skills, who are the ones producing the masks. At the moment, they have already produced 2,500 masks. And um, 
we have already purchased uh, 50 uh, uh, hand washing basins and the accompanying ones. And then we now have sealed the mask because we set up this um, uh, production center in accordance with the rules given to us by ICANN, which are in line with what WHO and CDC have prescribed. The kind of room, the space, the hygienic conditions, every mask has to be stitched and ironed and sealed, and they have to use gloves and all the like. So that's why we decided to set up a section for that. That's exactly what I've been doing. And then even as we go down to the field, we are doing our best to maintain the principle of do no harm. We don't go to, to expose ourselves to the disease, and we don't also want to be the ones to, to give this disease to the local people in the communities. So what is happening is they are identifying- I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you to wrap up a little bit because I know I'm watching the time and I wanna just go through a couple more kinds of questions if, if I could, so last yeah, minute. So basically that is where we are. The, the, uh, uh, the last part of the program is the watch party, which will be bringing in those people to talk and um, we continue identifying the IDPs and the women living with disabilities who are benefiting from our services. And at the same time, we have put an app in collaboration with another organization, we have put an app on our website. If you just Google Kajet, you will see that there is a, 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 a GBV alert that is going to come up. That is what we're also um, kind of advertising and asking women who are suffering GBV to connect with us there so that we can continue to refer them to the one-stop center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clotilda. Um, uh, Kate, I'm gonna ask you to swip, uh, flip to the next slide. I'm gonna come back to, to our participants in just a moment. But what I'm hearing right now um, is uh, quite a lot of uh, innovation and kind of, I think, really exciting possibilities of of how you are helping your, how your organizations are, uh, are, are under addressing the risk um, that we have right now and pivoting um, to ensure that the programs that you have are also responding to the crisis at hand. So what I found interesting by, by you know, in terms of the Clotilda's response as well as Elsie's responses and others is that your organizations are, are really um, looking at how do you, how you're sustaining yourselves um, while you're still focusing in on those that are the most vulnerable as I put on the next, on this slide that you, you see in front of you right now. Of course, you know, I, I, I have a particular focus here on, 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 on looking at gender, looking at women in particular, um, but you've already all mentioned um, working with children, looking at the age, uh, persons with disabilities, and of course, all of those are connected to looking at economic, at the economically marginalized. Um, next slide, Kate, please. Um, so, you know, so your your organizations are adapting, and uh, one of you also go to the next slide. One of you also mentioned that uh, your funders are have been flexible. That may or may not be the case for everybody, but. Um, you know, where, where possible, um, funders have been, uh, have been, I think, obviously responsive to the moment they're in. Everybody's in the same position. Um, this is the unique part of it that we are all in the same boat. Um, but I think what's, what I'm noticing also from an organizational level is a lot of concern um, that people have had to be either laid off or they're sitting at home and they're not able to work. Therefore, they're not able to get an income, and so this also fits. This also contributes to this churn of of fear and uneasiness and 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 worry that people have. Um, so go to the next slide, please, Kate. So this is just picking up on you know these are the questions that we've been asking ourselves. Um, you know how can we mobilize together? Um, I'm what I'm hearing um, from the conversation that we've just been having, and all of you are Cody grads. Um, but all of you are looking and addressing um, issues in a similar way um, based from your own organizational standpoint. So what are the ways that we can think uh, about working collectively, knowing that it's in addition to the pandemic, of course, there's, there's, there's you know, very serious conflict issues that are happening in the country, but what are the ways that we go back to thinking about at this, this stage, um, you know, the, the health and well-being of everyone, um, you know, the basic human needs 
um, in many ways is what we're back to at the moment, given the, the health crisis that we have. Um, and then, as, you, as, I, as I've mentioned earlier, many of you are facing in your organizations issues that are related to your own sustainability as organizations. So what is it that we can do to continue to ensure that we can meet those needs while also ensuring our sustainability? Um, all, of the, all of the examples that you've been providing, I think, have indicated some success in that, in that regard. But how do we, if this is the new normal, at least for quite a long time, for the next year okay. or so, what does mm -hmm. that mean in the long term for us? How do we need to be thinking about our strategies moving forward? So I'm, I'm going to go back um, for a moment to, uh, I know there was another hand up uh, by Ravi, but I do want to go back to Ada to, to see what her, you know, if she has any thoughts or reflections on what she's been hearing. And I also want to make sure that I'm not missing somebody who would like to speak. Um, so I haven't heard from patients. I haven't heard from Mary who are both on the line. Um, so I do want to make sure that that opportunity is there. If uh, Patients and, and Mary, if you do want to speak, just put your hand up so I can see. And Rogan and Ravi, you both had, uh, I think you wanted to also come back in and weigh in. Um, so uh, yeah, I see patients. So, but first I'm going to turn back to Ada and I'm going to keep an eye on the time. Um, but Ada, do you want to make a short uh, comment here? Um, you're you're muted. I'm going to unmute you. Hold on a second. Okay, Here you go. Go okay. ahead. I just want to thank sisters for. Uh, just, okay. I want to thank sisters for the great contribution, and the great input and the work that they've been doing on the ground, which is very pertinent at this time. But again, we we need to be able to provide space for safe care, because in all what we're doing, we need to have more webinars where we could be able to share and take away the load from our shoulders. Um, there is a lot on the ground on mental health and uh, my organization has been trying to do uh, some activities on psychosocial support for internally displaced women in the, in the Northwest uh, who are found in the, in the center region and in the West region. And uh, I think more on cycle social support is supposed to be given to everyone because even those who are at home are psychologically very depressed and there is a train of depression that is coming and that is what is going to kill so many people than the COVID pandemic, which we are afraid of. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of people are losing their jobs, especially in the educational sector, like Elliot said, since we're working in the schools. The private teachers do not have their salaries any longer because for four months now they, they have no salaries and also it gives space for gender-based violence to keep increasing because they will be able to take care of their families. So we get poverty in, its, in, its, uh, in, the, in the increase. We also have to be able to take care of the poor and needy how do we get to distribute food to people who cannot be able to afford food at this moment? My organization has been able to distribute food to 24 families, which we gave to internally displaced women. And we're thinking that if we have more support or more people can be able to put hands on deck, we should be able to think about giving food to people living with disability, the vulnerable who cannot be able to attain or get possibility of having food because of the lockdowns. Okay, talking about uh, uh, donation of face masks, I think that is what is on the ever. How do people use the face mask? We realized in a community not far away from Yaoundé, we have about 300 IDPs, internally displaced uh, population, who do not have any assistance. I think I went there and I did a need analysis, and I really realized that they really cannot be able to manage the things that are donated to them, especially uh, some of the sanitation equipment. Uh, most of them live um, in, in, uh, with host families and they don't have houses. The houses which they live in um, are, are abandoned houses of relatives of that community in Ebegda who are now maybe living out of Yaoundé. 
and they suffered a huge crisis where the rains came and removed the roofs of the houses and most of their things were damaged and they couldn't be able to manage the masks that were even given to them. So at the moment, they don't have masks. We have lots of children who need health care, children who are supposed to be able to be assisted during this period. There is also rape, abuses, lots of abuses uh, found in that, in that community. I'm just giving that community as a, an example. But there are yeah. other communities that face this, this problem. So, the, so, the so what, I, I, what I want to put in it, yeah, what I want to say is, in everything that we're doing, we, we mainstreaming gender. We want to be able to see how we are, are, are tackling uh, gender equality and also seeing how COVID can be mainstreamed in all the sectors that we work. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we manage to mainstream COVID in health, COVID in education, COVID in everything that we do because it is gradually, gradually uh, breaking down the, the system and also uh, the, 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 the support put in place. So I think that to me, it's, 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 it's a little contribution that I, I can put, sure. but we need to be able also to carry out research, do a situational analysis to see what is it that is being done on the ground in Cameroon and in other areas in terms of regulating uh, the, the measures that are put in ground, are they effectively being carried out? What is it that should be done? Because we realize that we are multiplying effects, multiplying our efforts in, in, in domains which we wouldn't have been doing, and other domains are left without anybody intervening. Young people are not part of the process, and young people are abandoned, and that's why we carried, we've decided to carry out a campaign with adolescent girls to be able to add their voices as volunteers for COVID. They should be able to talk about it in every domain where they are and accept it. And we are also telling them that COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic can also be transmitted through sexual intercourse. It can be transmitted through kissing. If you do not respect the social distances put in place, you do not respect um, uh, putting on your facial mask, you will be contaminated. And we see the, 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 um, the, the rates of teenage pregnancies increasing in the communities and also in the homes because there are no follow-up measures put in place to be able to curb down this effect on young people. I think that is what I wanted yeah. to add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. Lots of passion in your voice as you're talking about the young people, especially in, in what's going on um, in terms of uh, some communities where there's <laughs> so little assistance. Um, so I have five people with hands up and I'm, and I'm mindful of time. I'm assuming people want to continue the conversation a little bit longer, but I'm going to ask um, each of those five people if you can keep your interventions short and, and concise. Um, so the people I have are patience, and then Robbie, and then Rogan, and then Josephine, and then Clotilda. And then I think after that we'll stop. So patience over to you and, and please don't mind me if I if I cut people off. It's because I'm also wanting to watch the time. But patience, I'm turning to you. If you can unmute yourself. Yes, I have. Hello everyone. I am Patience Sakwinja. Uh, well, I took part in the Community Development Leadership by Women 2013, Diploma 2014, and the Fellowship of uh, 2016 with the Women's Center. So what I, I have to say, uh, basically I'm not, the engagement I have around COVID in Cameroon is on research. And as you almost have noticed, uh, the recent writing that I did with Cody and Participadia has been published. And when that was done, I took upon myself to follow up with a few graduates to try to find out and document what was doing. I picked on Ada and Clotilda. So while I was following up with them and having some questions for them, I saw that this uh, invitation came up for us to discuss as Cody graduate. And it is timely mm -hmm. for me because I've picked up a personal research to bring together all what we are doing and, and see how we can generate lessons learned from 
community engagement around COVID and drawing lessons from there to integrate into what, what really uh, is the emergency management approach Cameroon is taking. So I'm hoping that from these discussions, I've been taking notes and like I discussed with most of the women, I'm hoping that after this session, I can be able to have brief writings from each person and maybe a little follow up on what is going on so I can put together what other organizations are doing or what graduates of CODI in Cameroon are doing. So uh, I won't talk so much. All what I'm doing now is listening, writing, and seeing how we can make sense with everything we are doing. I'm available to work with anybody on research and anything that is required or any skills that I have to use to accompany everyone's action whether as an organization or as an individual, I'm available. So thank you very much. Uh, that's what I had to say. Well, briefly, that's, that's what is important for now. Well, thank, thank you. you very much, Patience. And um, I do want to echo Patience in that um, it's a great opportunity for us to be making sure that our, our collective uh, voices, the voices of our organizations are being heard and, um, and sharing that and compiling that is, is, uh, is uh, I think uh, a great way to um, engage in further conversations about how this group of, of very diverse men and women can come together um, as Cody graduates and think about collective action. And I do want to point out um, that we did hear from a few people that they were already doing um, storytelling as part of their organizational work. Um, and so well, what are those stories that are coming out? That to me is the is the, the starting point of all the research really is, is you know, sharing the stories of, uh, of how communities are responding and coping. Um, so now I'm turning over to Rabi, who has her hand up and has been waiting. And Rabi, a very uh, short intervention from you, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Tani. Hello. Hello, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh I must say that coming back from Cody in 2018 with um, the course on community-based microfinance for inclusion, uh, we engage in getting the woman actually involved. In the network, there existed already uh, the structure for women, but uh, the challenge was that women were not really enjoying their membership as far as the financial management was concerned. So we decided, um, to be able to involve the woman in the kind of products that we conceived, especially with the unit that we call the Agric Value Chain Financing Unit. And uh, most women who are doing petit trading were involved. But now, in this uh, involvement, what has the pandemic done to them? Most of them are doing little things like selling of food and give them petty minor loans to do that, mini credits to do that. But with the coming advent of the pandemic, it's been very challenging and some of, some of them are becoming very delinquent. Why are they delinquent? Uh, the state first of all gave us uh, a measure that included uh, reducing uh, the number of passengers in cars because they have to go to the suburbs, buy the goods and come and sell, which became so expensive for them. Mm -hmm. And then not many people were really buying because of the other situations that we've explained. And so there was a lot of delinquency. In the measures that we've taken, one of them has been to be able to review the loan portfolio on a case-by-case -case situation and with a priority on the woman because their loans are never much, but they are the breadwinners. And so we, that's what we've been doing. And so when we review and listen to you and see that it is feasible in another installment, your loan is rescheduled. And like I was saying, most of the women do not um, um, know how to manage the gadgets. Unlike what I've seen in other countries, uh, people are very much in the digital, digitalized economy. It's not the case with us. But we're trying to because we've involved new products. Recently in the month of April with the advent of the pandemic, um, the network uh, signed a three-party agreement uh, where we can be doing uh, lending and repayment through a product that we call Momo Cash, uh, which, which was in partnership with the Tenefuni company, MTN, and a platform called Quediscam. We're trying to uh, boot the rice it right now. And we also try to involve people to be able to save and pay through the mobile telephony, mobile money uh, transfer services. 
so the major challenge that he having now is um, the dissemination of these ideas uh, such that people um, get to accept it and do it. Because most of them are so scared in manipulating the gadgets. So it is, it is, it is a process that is challenging. And so if there was, because I'm coming to the question Eileen asks about what can we do collectively? How do we disseminate the fact that social distancing for now that there is still COVID is important, such that you must not come to the credit union to do your transaction. You can do it using your telephone. You can borrow money, uh, you can repay. Pay through the and other we are having, which I think if together collectively we can bring someone that is development of new products in context, such that the woman will not be fragilized, economically fragilized the way she is the more. So basically, I think that is uh, what I think together as I listen and appreciate what I'm already getting from the uh, quadi uh, platform from what is what happening in other countries. I think that is what we're thinking that we were looking at as way forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Robbie, for that intervention and some excellent ideas for, for collective um, engagement. I'm just seeing here um, that Mary um, Munyao, oh, sorry. Of course, Mary, I was wondering what you were doing crashing the party from Kenya. But uh, Mary, from uh, who is a Cody graduate from Kenya, um, yeah. was listening in to, to learn more about uh, about what is happening in Cameroon. And I encourage all of you to go to the Cody website and and uh, and do take a look at some of the other recorded webinars from the other countries and see and you can see both the similarities as well as the context specificity um, of uh, of the different ways in which. Um, communities are responding to the pandemic. Rogan, I'm turning now to you for a moment to share uh, a, a succinct uh, intervention. Are you still there, Rogan? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So um, just not to repeat myself from what others uh, participants just highlighted, I would just want to um, um, say that um, um, from from our anal analysis, it shows that um, um, we as a community organization, we as um, a nation, we we were unprepared for this pandemic. So what I'm what I want to recommend for this um, 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 forum mm -hmm. is that we could push forward for an emergency preparedness management act for even at the level of community organizations or community network to see because from what the science is saying what the experts are saying is like there, there will be another wave of covid coming so now let us learn from this this unpreparedness how we manage this current situation and see how we could prepare for the future because um, like what the other um, participants were saying, how to mainstream that into the organizational management, which is nice. But then let us come up with something like uh, emergency preparedness uh, act in terms of COVID and other pandemics, which um, as we live in the world, as human, we interact with animals and stuff like that, just to make sure we get stuff going. We can, that is inevitable. So I will also try to look at areas of creating a synergy because um, I think this is like one of the first time I had to like actually look at the faces of other Cameroonians from Kozi. I've never heard of um, seeing them like in person, even though in the same country. So it's actually a nice um, forum. And if we could end up coming up with a synergy to see how we could capitalize on this and build up a platform that we could also share some of the best practices like what patients were saying, document them and have something that we could actually build on the strength and what works in the other spot, what doesn't work and how we could move on further. So I don't want to talk much, but I think we could actually build a, a very strong force to go out with some of the issues that need to be addressed going forward. Yes, thanks so much, Rogan. And Rogan, you've been surrounded by fierce, amazing women, uh, <laughs> graduates that have been on the call and uh, 
you know, thank you very much for that. You know, I was thinking earlier about uh, something that Clotilda said around uh, around gender-based violence and around the around the uh, the understandings of masculinities um, and what it means for men who you know can't you know make in, make an income right now um, and who are sitting at home and how this is also uh, you know how this is also affecting the household. Um, any observations about um, ways in which we can look at gender-based violence and and think about um, uh, act, actions for um, addressing men and, and building up the idea of male champions. Any thoughts from you before I turn to the next uh, people? I think, I think um, to me, what, what, what I believe could be the, the mm -hmm. how we could actually get this done is to see that each time we talk about gender-based violence, it's not just addressing issues in women, 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 okay? How do we get the boys and men involved in the fight? Exactly. Because actually at some point, they are some of the perpetrators of the act. So, but if we put them, engage them. So we had a program that was, um, if not mistakenly, that was in 2010, long time ago with, um, there's an organization in Bamenda, for those of you in Bamenda, they call them Wa Cameroon. They call the organization Wa Cameroon somewhere in Tarinkun. We had a program, an advocacy program, and one of that uh one of the tools that was uh, recommended by the founder at for that program that was bread for the world from germany was that we actually engage the the men and boys into the fight against gender-based violence so we had this advocacy and we use um some of um, the funds in the northwest region we know we live in a society where the traditional rulers, they are very, very respectable figure in the community and the community people actually pay a lot of allegiance to them. Yeah. So that was an entry point to make sure they assemble some of the men that were using the program. So to my, to my perspective, I think it actually works if we engage the men and boys into the fight against gender-based violence and not, not looking at them as at one end, just like the perpetrators of the act, as pushing the agenda of women, 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 but also at some point trying to create the balance between um, the men and the women in fighting against gender-based violence. I think that would be a very good approach. And also having the men standing in front talking about issues affecting women and also trying to create, because we live in a society where the men have that power, they, they have that authority and women because of the the economic imbalance women always tend to depend on their husband for little things and men take advantage of the authority and trying to to use that to take advantage over women most of the time so, so mm -hmm. that most of the situation that disparity always is always there and then certain norms in the community certain norms in the society put men at that certain position that women have that limit powers. So we're trying to see how advocates at the level of traditions to see how they could loosen some of those um, um, religious, those cultural practices that always make create that disparity in terms of power relations mm -hmm. between men and women so that women could be free, women could be empowered, sure. women could make decisions, women could be engaged into traditional council, women could take leadership roles. I, I work in a situation where we actually um, um, review our our, our our, our administrative and um, administrative procedure, our, our organizational administrative procedure, which were adopted, it says that within the, the management of the board, if all the five position of the board is occupied by women, 100%, it is validated. But if the president happens to be a male, the vice president and the secretary general must be female. But in short, a way that 70% could be female and 25% male. So giving women that leadership role. So if for some That's reason good. they have a, a general elective meeting and the women I, are not involved, I, I, that is I, not I feel not I validated. put you on the spot, Rogan, and now <laughs> no, I got that's you. Okay. <laughs> I, I put you on the spot, but thank, but thank no, you. Not. I think what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is, uh, is definitely a commitment, which is fantastic. And uh, you know, this could take us into a whole other webinar. So maybe we'll, We'll put it off to the side for now, but thank you very much, um, 
Uh, I do want to say that we've got two more people still on our list, Josephine and Clotilda, and uh, and we are getting uh, very, very uh, over time now, but um, if I could just ask Josephine um, to keep her, uh, to say a few words and keep it uh, short and precise. Josephine? Thank you, Eileen. Thanks for all the wonderful things I've heard today. I've learned a lot. Actually, I am looking at, um, I will just go straight to my agriculture sector because um, I, I guess there are some solutions we can put on board collectively. And I am looking at um, uh, non-agricultural livelihood activities. The women in the local uh, communities cannot make it because they can't go to their farm. So if we can collectively benchmark on some non-agricultural livelihood activities that will uh, enhance their economic lives. I'm also looking at um, TV talks. I'm already doing TV talks with some media to advocate for government to re-strategize during this COVID period because everything has practically changed and as someone said, we're not prepared. So one of the things I'm looking at is advocating for government to reduce prices of uh, basic commodities in our markets and also to reduce taxes. And yes, because of this advocacy, government has reduced taxes of some of the um, small enterprises, you know, um, around the corner. So that is a, a, a very good one. And then we, I'm also looking at um, government increasing um, subvention to agricultural uh, people in the local uh, communities, because these people cannot make it by themselves. Some of them have um, um, gone to the bank and taken money, loans, that they cannot reform because one, they cannot go to their farms because of COVID. And secondly, they cannot uh, definitely refund the money um, to, the, to the bankers. So while we are also looking at how to have discussions with bankers, we should also be looking at how governments can subvent them during these very crucial times. Equally, um, reinforcing sensitization as, at grassroots. If we must fight to reduce COVID, then we must look for mechanisms to sensitize at the level of grassroots. It is, um, so, yes, it's going to be difficult because sometimes we have to take that risk to go there, but we do it in a calculated way and it's important that those people who say no, there's no COVID, should at least know there's COVID. And we can do it as joining um, Clotilda mentioned that. And then I'm also thinking about carrying out a gender-based analysis to provide, um, to actually prioritize per segment the areas of priority in terms of intervention. If we do that as, as a collective team, we can then do informed choices of the activities that we can be doing. Now, thanks, uh, Rogan, welcome. There is Co uh, Cody Cameroon alumni boy. So you, we, I'll just add you immediately. Please send your, your number. We are adding you to the forum immediately. So we'll be having more conversations on how we can work better collectively. Let me just add to the fact that we need to in continue peace building advocacy very strongly. Because in the areas where there is conflict, we cannot refuse that. If there is conflict, there is no development and therefore the people will die in poverty and hunger. So we continue calling for ceasefire from the government and any other, uh, uh, any other voices that could be added to make the whole world to listen and to, to, to do something about ceasefire. Because right now, a lot of havoc is happening in the communities. Women are being raped and all what they have already said. And then we must continue to... Um, last, last point, Josephine. Hello. Hello. Last point. Uh -huh. The last point, very, very crucial last point, Ellen. Thank you. Is that we should advocate very strongly for land acquisition for women in local communities. I am doing nutrition projects with these women. When I sensitize them, I need to. We need to go do collective uh, community farms for their vegetable, the mm -hmm. vegetable um, farms. These women don't have rights to land in local communities. And that is very crucial. If we are looking at the present, the midterm, and the long term, we have to collectively start thinking of strategies to 
make the government to give them some, you know, to rights to acquire land in, in, in local communities. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. There's a lot of, there was a lot of content in that short intervention, Josephine. Thank you. No, I was rushing for that much. Good. And I'm going to ask uh, Clotilda to keep it very short. And then I see, Robbie, you've got your hand back up. Please, if you've got other things that you wanted to say that we didn't get a chance to get to, put, type them in the chat quickly um, as we wrap up. But Clotilda, very quickly mm -hmm. to you. Yo, thank you, Ellie. And thank you, Madam Duala, for that lengthy intervention. Uh, um, I think they have said most of what I wanted to say, but I want to come to the area of sustainability. I think we want to see how we can, NGOs can be sustainable in their activities right now. I buy in the idea that we should build a synergy. Building a synergy now means that it will be important for us to concretize this platform of Kodi alumni with the Kodi Institute. I think we already mentioned something about uh, our wish to have flexible funding. If we can be able to have flexible funding, because we already know that this it is going to be like a new normal, and which means it's not going to be very easy for organizations to continue maybe receiving funding the way they were receiving when things were very normal. And we now have to handle things from a double perspective in order to survive. So um, my wish is that if we could uh, maybe join with the Cody Institute, maybe to, to develop proposals or whatever, so that can be able to provide uh, to members of this um, platform some kind of flexible or core funding. I think there are two different things. You have flexible funding, you have core funding, so that the organizations can be able to continue doing their activities. It is true that we are exposed to you here. So we can come back to you, we can have webinars all the time. We can be updated on what is happening. We can learn everything. Okay. But we need to be able to get this stuff. We need to be able to get down to the people in the field. And now the new challenge is most of what is happening is happening on, on the use of such appliances like the telephones, the computer, the internet, those, they are becoming very necessary gadgets for every organization to be able to function effectively because if one of the key points of COVID-19 is advising people to stay at home and we are working on virtual space, there is need for us to see how we can have this back up of having these um, gadgets available for all of us to be able to move ahead. Um, I just want to say... Last point. Please. Your Hello? last point, please. Yes. You said, uh, you have said something about peace building. I want to say that the core of my course in Kodi was on peace building as a woman leader, global change leader. And I want to say that it gave me a lot of strength and it is actually the backbone of what I am doing right now. So just to support Josephine, it is very important that we continue to do the peace building work. We continue to increase women's agency in the peace building. And so if we actually build this, um, this platform that we can be able to intervene and maybe give advice to my government from time to time on how things ought to be done. Like we, as Kodi alumni, we have found out this, we have done this study down the field. We have seen that women are not ready now for reconstruction or whatever. We can quickly do that kind of a study and submit it. It can easily get to the government if we pass through uh, an institution like uh, Kodi. And just to support my brother, I want to say that we already have uh, component in our organization that we call men as partners in gender-based violence. We're just doing a session with them and they are the ones now sharing their own points as far as what kind of instances of violations do they have so that when we want to talk to the women, we are also telling them that this gender-based violence is not just from one side. We want to listen to from the men. And each time men have shared their stories, women have seen that they have also been violating their rights. So thank you very much. Thank you, Clotilda. Okay, I'm going to have, unfortunately, the time has come to an end for our, for our, uh, our webinar. Um, and I apologize. I know that there's still conversation that people would like to have. Um, but I'm also realizing they, uh, that we're getting close to the two hour mark already. Um, and, and we've got another one going on after this. Um, some final thoughts from me, um, uh, from the Cody side, um, is just to say, 
you know, I, I'm hearing, um, I'm hearing uh, the, the numerous challenges that are happening in, in Cameroon right now, and none of them can be ignored. Um, the, the, the pandemic has added a whole other layer to, to um, very big issues around, um, around violence, around uh, conflict that continues in parts of the country. Um, and so the challenges are enormous, but I also see the resilience and the opportunity and the determination of, of people like you um, who are really continuing the hard work um, to support your communities and to move things, move things forward in a good way. Um, I do want to echo a comment that was raised uh, by um, my co-facilitator, Ada, around self-care and recognizing that we are in this unprecedented moment right now um, in addition to conflict and, to, and, to, and, and an uncertainty that already existed we now are all facing um, a lot of uh, a, a very difficult time um, and so taking care of ourselves and taking care of our families has to be a priority it has to be the top of our list um, and we're all going to come out of this that, and requiring some kind of healing. Um, and that's going to be a whole other health issue to be thinking through. Um, the, the result of trauma, not just of, of ongoing um, challenges that are faced by everyone, but also, in addition, this idea of social distancing, which is so foreign to our idea of community. Um, you know, the idea that we can't be close to our loved ones, that we can't be that we can't be uh, that we can't be um, uh, close to our friends. So taking care of each other, taking care of ourselves, continuing the work that we are doing on peace building is important. Um, and I want to echo again and encourage all of you to think about how you're documenting the learning that you are that you are having both as individuals, but also in terms of the associations and the organizations that you represent. Start gathering that information, share it with each other. I'm certainly open to hearing more about the collective work that, that can be done and the ways in which Cody can support that work um, to happen. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to Ada to, uh, and we're going to say uh, thank you. Um, Ada, back to you, any last, any last word um, as, we are, as we're closing the conversation? Uh, I'm going to unmute you, Ada. There you go. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I'm okay. Now go ahead. It keeps muting you again. You're muted again. I think we're all trying to play with your control. Sorry about that. Can you unmute it again, Ada, please? Nobody else touch it. Okay, go ahead now. Can anybody hear her? Because I can't hear her. Oh dear, we can't hear you, Ada. We can't hear you at all, my dear. I'm afraid there's a problem, unfortunately, with Ada's, uh, with Ada's microphone. So I'm going to say on behalf of Ada, um, and if she gets back online, that's okay. Um, but you know, on behalf of, uh, thank you very much to Ada and to Kate for, that, for the work that we did to prepare for the, for the webinar. Um, and a reminder that it was recorded today. So we'll have it available to you. Um, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you again. And again, um, on behalf of Cody, we wish all of you well, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, all the best to you and your families uh, moving forward. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, so good to see everyone. Me Such too. a great, great chance to see all of you. I think I know pretty much everybody on the call, almost. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you so much.